there was a time in motorcycle history when there really was just a few different kinds of motorcycles. I mean, look no further than just about any manufacturer's lineup in, say, the mid-60s. Sure, there's some different sizes, really just different capacities, though. But basically, most of the companies pretty much just made one motorcycle. Compared to now, a time when you can choose, for example, between all of the different subcategories of touring. So sport touring, adventure touring, and um, Harley touring. There are motorcycles dedicated to off-road, on-road, and everything in between. What do you want? You know, 12% on-road? We got that for you. Oh, you're thinking more like 37% off-road? Great, try the, you know, Super Tenere Rally Dakar edition with touring spec and multiple rider modes. I like to think of these sort of subgenres of motorcycles as ideas that came from splits. So we have, for example, sport bikes that at some point were split into being, you know, fully fared and also naked sport bikes, or touring bikes that split into adventure and adventure touring and sport touring, scramblers that split into fully dedicated dirt bikes, and then, you know, enduros. Most of these influential splits within the different kinds of motorcycles were happening actually in the 1970s, and Honda was at the forefront of it all. In 1969, the Honda CB750 shook up the motorcycle industry harder than a handshake from an insecure old man. The very idea of what a good touring motorcycle could be had been turned on its head by this motorcycle. Reliability, performance, quality, ease of use, affordability, and really just the idea of being able to trust your motorcycle to put down huge miles without problems and without, you know, needing to be a mechanic. Well, all of this was pretty much a new concept. As much as many point to the CB750 as the first superbike, which it certainly was, but in many ways it was really the first great grand touring motorcycles. And like so many great motorcycles, it would experience that same split with Honda's next big endeavor, which was the Goldwing. The high-revving inline-4 of the CB750 would go on in one direction in the coming decades, basically sport bikes, but the original intention of the CB750 would go the direction of the Goldwing. By 1972, the next evolution of the CB750 formula, that is a bigger, more capacity, air-cooled inline-4 touring bike, well that had already come out, but it hadn't come out from Honda. Honda. You know, I think we often forget how quickly the Japanese companies have always been able to put each other on the back foot. Every good story has an inciting incident, and for Honda and the Honda Goldwing, it just so happened to be the Kawasaki Z1. This motorcycle was everything the CB750 had been, and then some. More of that smooth, high revving power, but Honda was ready to respond with something new. This brings us to the Goldwing. You know, we talk about the CB750 as being such an amazing, innovative machine for its time, but in many ways the Goldwing was just as much, if not more, of a technical tour de force. It was the fall of 1972, and the president of Honda Motor Company, Soichiro Honda, had a new project in mind. He wanted to create what he called the King of Motorcycles, basically the best grand touring motorcycle to ever be made. If you've watched my other videos on iconic Honda motorcycles, you've probably heard the name of another Soichiro from Honda, which was Soichiro Irimajiri. Once again, this project was headed up by Irimajiri. That guy just really never missed, honestly. And once again, he was given no simple task to create the undisputed fastest, best machine for grand touring. Project M1 would begin immediately, resulting in a single prototype of unworldly specs for this time, 1500 cc's of horizontally opposed or boxer liquid-cooled six-cylinder goodness with a single camshaft over each set of cylinders. Now, if you know the history of the Goldwing, you know that this specific layout wouldn't come to fruition in the model line for pretty much another 20 years after this prototype was designed. But it's incredible to know that Honda had the long-term DNA of the Goldwing all the way back in the mid-70s when they first started working on it. Along with this rather automotive engine tucked into the double cradle frame, much else was taken straight from BMW, including the shaft drive. The package as a whole, though, didn't quite work, the big flat six performed about on par with the Z1, but Honda couldn't get the riding position right at this point 
and honestly, as we've seen with many models, through the mid and late 70s, the frame and suspension design was not often ready for the massive increases in power and weight. So Honda decided to chuck the big six-cylinder 1500 in the garbage and instead turn to making a flat four. Now with this new project, leadership was changed from Irmajiri to Toshio Nozu. Now Nozu was no slouch either, Mainly he was a frame designer, and he had a few big projects under his belt already with the Elsinore and the CB750. At this point, the name was also decided, which was the Goldwing, in honor of Honda's iconic wing logo. This motorcycle was to be the new flagship model made to compete with the best any other company had to offer. Now, it's important to understand the landscape at this point. Of course, there's the big Z1 from Kawasaki, but beyond the Japanese motorcycles that were coming out at this point, there's no denying the likes of Harley and BMW. Honda's goal was to make a thoroughly American motorcycle meant for the open road, and at this point the standout bike for that job, for the American riders, was the Harley FLH 1200 Electroglide. Despite lacking the innovation in terms of, you know, engine design, this motorcycle was a pretty good touring bike dual front disc brakes, a full-blown security system, wind protection, and, you know, this was really the ultimate comfortable experience prior to the Goldwing. This was the motorcycle that Honda was taking aim at. Now, for the Goldwing, 999 cc's was chosen as the displacement for the new Boxer 4 engine, bigger than a Z1, R90S, and Moto Guzzi V7, but not necessarily more powerful. Initial numbers were somewhat meager, for the new Goldwing, with prototypes producing about 80 horsepower at 7,500 RPM. I mean, the Z1 from years earlier made 82 horsepower and revved out quite a bit more. Essentially, the flat four of the Goldwing was two 180 degree parallel twins, basically just laid down opposite of each other. Besides being liquid cooled, the standout feature was the motorcycle's incredible smoothness, something that would define the Goldwing going forward. Utilizing innovative automotive technology like a toothed rubber timing belt, shaft drive, and an incredible AC generator as a counter-rotating flywheel canceling out the torque reaction of the crankshaft. In simple terms, essentially Honda cured that divisive rocking effect known in Moto Guzzi's and BMW's engines, though some do like that torque movement, and it's become a selling point of, you know, character for BMW and Guzzi, but for many, this was the standout feature of the Goldwing. They were able to get that low center of gravity of this awesome engine layout, but it was now available without most of the problems that came with, again, BMWs and Guzzi's. The tank was actually a glove box, as the actual fuel tank was relocated to underneath the seat. It had triple disc brakes and a special thick Bridgestone tire that was designed specifically for the Goldwing. Rumors circulated that Honda actually spent over half a million pounds just developing the tire for the original Goldwing. That may or may not be true, but many believe it. Now Honda's usual eight month period of brutal testing was closer to a year for this bike, and the single biggest problem encountered was just how difficult the bike was to pick up if it fell over. Initial minimalist styling was essentially kept for the prototype in the actual production model. It was a kind of no-nonsense styling meant to really never get in the way of the utilitarian nature of this motorcycle. The first gen Goldwing was brilliantly simple in concept, and like so many great machines throughout history, it was more than the sum of its parts. Honda had taken the right mixture of innovative, but not entirely new features, though I think they felt that this was the first liquid-cooled motorcycle. It wasn't. But whether it be shaft drive, liquid cooling, rubber timing belts, they paired it all perfectly into a package that felt very futuristic for its time, a sort of half car, half motorcycle. Now, the GL1000KO was released in October of 74 at the famed Cologne show to a rather polarized response, and little has changed with this motorcycle. Though many riders got in line to pre-order, quite a few thought that Honda had just gone too far with the Goldwing. This was too much like a car. Many felt that the bike was too complex, too heavy, and too ugly. In June of 1975, it was launched at the Isle of Man TT, probably not the best venue for this bike, and there it was absolutely ridiculed. Some called it a two-wheeled car, others called it the Honda Leadwing. In January of 76, a now infamous road test from British journalist Bill Haycock in Bike Magazine dropped, and Bill, he didn't like the direction that Honda was going. That road test Hasn't exactly aged well, but it's kind of infamous. Bill was clearly not concerned with testing the Goldwing on its own merit 
as a Turing machine and was more just kind of comparing it to his Ducati. But for riders, particularly in the American market, where Honda was really targeting, and specifically American riders who really liked to put down lots of miles and really tour, those riders knew what Honda had just built. The comfort and ease of use and sophistication actually went beyond motorcycling and started to bring in new riders who found the Goldwing really appealing. The interesting thing is, so many of the new features on the Goldwing that were criticized by the riding community at this time would become absolute standards going forward, whether it was liquid cooling or even simple things like electric fuel pumps. These were just completely unnecessary in many people's minds. Now road tests at the time found, somewhat surprisingly, that the rather heavy new touring machine actually stood its ground among the superbikes of its day, with a standing quarter mile time of 12.92 seconds. But see, the Goldwing wasn't really entirely meant to be a superbike, and over time, the power would not really be about speed, but more about usability and comfort and cruising. Now thanks to the growing appreciation of the model in the United States, it didn't take long for Honda to start selling roughly 25,000 Goldwings a year year, primarily to white-collar, middle-class Americans who are in their 40s and who are quite willing to spend the extra money, not only for one of the most expensive motorcycles that money could buy, but also for all the accessories. In the few years following its inception, despite sales being significantly below what Honda expected, they invested quite a bit in the Goldwing and the ultimate touring concept, continuing to make changes to make the bike more comfortable and usable, and do things, you know, like lower noise and lower vibration. Honda also worked to make the Goldwing less of a drag strip performer and more of just a highway machine. The Goldwing as an American product also pushed Honda to finally build a US plant for manufacturing, not just for motorcycles, but also for automobiles. Now, 1980 saw the first major change to the Goldwing with the GL1100. No doubt Honda felt the pressure from companies like Yamaha with their XS1100, and especially Kawasaki with the Z1300. Big touring-focused motorcycles were becoming a market in and of itself, and if the Goldwing was to remain king of the road, Honda would need to continue innovating. To some, the GL1100 was just a big bore version of the previous model, but those who knew, knew that this was essentially an all-new motorcycle, maximum load capacity was upped, something the Goldwing is still kind of king for, the suspension and comfort was upped, the strength of the crankshaft was increased, and most importantly, an all-new clutch was developed. The clutch was the Mark I Goldwing's probably worst problem. A new ignition setup and much more once again set the Goldwing apart as the ideal touring machine for the open road. Now this year also marked the beginning of a new era for the Goldwing with the Interstate Edition. The first time Honda had made a Goldwing available was the Interstate with a factory fairing. Finally a Goldwing fully decked out with all the accessories straight from the factory and you know finally it had a fully integrated look and vibe that you just couldn't achieve with aftermarket fairings. Aftermarket fairings at this time were pretty bad. It's here where we started to see all of the luxury items come into play from built-in CB radio, stereo, intercom systems, additional gauges. This version of the Honda Goldwing was an instant success and it really would impact not only the Goldwing but just the idea of what a touring machine could be. You know there's no CVO for example today without the original GL1100 Interstate. Honda would go on to make even more luxurious versions of the 1100. At every level, Honda was redefining what a luxury touring motorcycle could be, both in performance and specs, but also factory options, including things like built-in air compressors. And at this point in the early 80s, the bike had really taken on a sort of cult status. It was moving into its final form with massive updates in the form of the GL1200 in 84, but 1988 would mark the biggest and most important change in Goldwing history with the GL1500. Now this is the Goldwing as we know it today. No matter how advanced, no matter how big it gets, it finds its heritage as the ultimate Winnebago of motorcycles right here with this model, the original GL1500. If early dissenters thought the GL1000 was a car on two wheels, imagine what they would have thought if Honda had just started with this bike. The interesting thing is, that sort of was the intention. Sure, the fully fared model that the Goldwing had become wasn't exactly known in 1973 when Irmajiri thought up the big six-cylinder Goldwing prototype, but the idea of 
a full-blown kind of car motorcycle was there. Before it was common, Honda actually went to Goldwing owners to see what they would want out of their all-new models, and it turns out Goldwing owners just kind of want more of everything. More luxury, more smoothness, if that's a thing, and most important, more power. Inspiration from that original prototype of a flat six-cylinder liquid-cooled engine was right there available, and Soichiro Irmajiri, that is the original project leader who thought up the flat six, he was now the head of American Honda, so it's no surprise that they sort of turned back to that setup. At that time, the length needed to fit a flat six was way too much, but now that original prototype, it looked like a mini bike compared to what the Goldwing had become. The new 1500 GL weighed 883 pounds, and it absolutely dwarfed the 484 pound prototype flat six from 1973. I mean, think about that. The Goldwing had completely changed the perception of motorcycles. In that time, a big motorcycle was 500 pounds, and now, already, the Goldwing was pushing 900 pounds. No expense was spared in creating the new Goldwing. 20 separate engines were designed and developed for testing, consistently run at redline for the equivalent of 60,000 miles. Honda had never developed a motorcycle to this extent, and this is exactly why the 1500 Goldwing would go down as one of the most reliable, absolutely indestructible motorcycles of all time. Also, this is a time where Honda just did this. You know, many of Honda's over-engineered cars also come out of this time period. I think the real important factor is that the Goldwing had established itself as the premier touring machine at this point, so there was no necessity to also make the Goldwing a superbike anymore, or have, you know, superbike performance like the original GL1000 had to. So Honda went all in on comfort and highway use, with all the engineering really leading to that goal, and also torque instead of power was really what was prioritized, comfort over any sort of real sport bike speed. The dated tubular frame was ditched for the 1500 and replaced with a frame consisting of two giant box section steel main load bearing members and those ran from the steering head to the swing arm pivot and everything done to the frame was really meant to not only be able to handle the weight but also improve handling and maneuverability. And the end product, with you know even more automotive features taken from Honda's experience making cars, was a motorcycle that was smoother, even quieter, lower maintenance, and more sophisticated. Honda went all out with this bike. They even added an electric reverse gear to help riders get the bike around easier. One of the standout features going forward that was in some ways present in the early Goldwings, but really at this point, was the focus on passenger comfort. Nothing so roomy and plush and wonderful had ever existed for a pillion. You know, riding passenger on a Goldwing 1500 was better than riding in a car. Well, at least better than riding in the back seat of a car, which does suck. Ultimately, the GL 1500 would go down as the most important innovative touring machine since that original Goldwing some 15 years prior. Despite being one of the most expensive motorcycles that money could buy, throughout the 1990s, it would become one of the best-selling motorcycles in America. The Goldwing would influence lots of competitors through the 90s and would spawn bikes like the Valkyrie, which was based heavily on the Goldwing platform. Honda would release sidecar and trailer versions of the Goldwing, but the fifth and in some ways final version of the Goldwing would come in 2001 as the GL1800. Honda wisely chose to stay somewhat conservative with this model. Many speculated an entirely new engine layout, but that just wasn't necessary. The Goldwing was still the best touring motorcycle in the world at this point, so Honda just decided to continue to develop and improve the Flat 6, mainly with an increase in capacity, making it the largest capacity motorcycle in the world. Along with this, a new design was really needed. It was starting to look a bit dated. This motorcycle was so much more though than just a new body and an increase in capacity. Honda spent years developing the new 1800 Goldwing and the end result was a more flowing motorcycle that fit better with the times and that was updated in all the necessary ways. The engine was updated primarily for more power, better fuel efficiency, and ultimately a slimmer profile for the rider's feet to have more room. Honda was so smart at this point, and it's always been this way with the Goldwing. Whoever heads up the project is really in charge of not only the bike, but really reaching out to Goldwing riders, and it turns out Goldwing owners aren't actually that interested in tech for the sake of tech, as some think. Ultimately, these are the ridiest riders 
in the entire motorcycle world, there are few people who ride more and put down more miles than Goldwing owners, and essentially, they just wanted a better riding machine. The specifics are quite impressive, and at this point, I have to give a shout out to Ian Falloon's wonderful book on the history of the Goldwing. I'll link that down below if you guys are interested in learning more. But yeah, the GL1800 was completely overhauled. It was essentially a new motorcycle. Now, the final update would come in 2018. Once again, a completely redesigned motorcycle, though maintaining the same layout and the same capacity. The Goldwing is now an interesting mix of some of the most state-of-art technology and, you know, focus on safety. You've got the Goldwing airbag version, but really it's just decades of learning from Honda, learning what it takes to make ultimately a rider's machine. Now, you can't mention the Goldwing without recognizing the Goldwing Road Riders Association, one of the longest running and largest motorcycle clubs ever, with massive influence on Honda and its development of the Goldwing, and really just creating the cult status of this motorcycle. Sadly, the GWRRA just closed last year after essentially coming into existence just a few years after the release of the Goldwing way back in the mid-70s. So they were around for a really long time. The Goldwing essentially started a trend that has massively impacted the motorcycle industry, more than even the CB750, honestly, and that is a focus on purpose-built motorcycles. Whether it's dirt bikes and touring machines or sport bikes or track bikes or, you know, naked bikes or adventure bikes, the idea of making a motorcycle that is so good at one thing Riders who want that kind of ride would just be crazy to choose anything else. That's what the Goldwing is for touring. The Goldwing makes me question who the real motorcyclists are as well. As much as some of us like to ridicule it for essentially being a two-wheeled car and act like, you know, it's not a real motorcycle because of that, many who ride these bikes really ride them and because they're looking for a motorcycle that can just easily and comfortably put down thousands of miles, yeah, they choose the Goldwing. It's a rider's ride. There's no denying that. We all use motorcycles for different purposes. Frankly, I don't ride thousands and thousands of miles. And so I'm in no place to talk bad about those who choose a motorcycle primarily because they ride a lot. I mean, how can you hate on that? And here's also the great thing. If you do want to put down a bunch of miles and you don't have a lot of money, you can pick up, say, a GL1500 from the late 80s or early 90s for a few thousand dollars, and sure, it might have 100,000 miles on it, but it's probably got 200,000 more left to go. That thing will go forever. If you really want to ride and you don't care about looking cool, just get yourself an old Goldwing. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this history of the Honda Goldwing. I know many of you probably have Goldwings or have had Goldwings. And as always, I would love to hear your stories. So let them loose in the comments below, and we'll see you guys in the next one. Ride safe.